Okay? On our wedding day, almost 32 years ago, a crystal bowl that's remained in its original box for 32 years. <laughs> Frank and I got married December the 20th. It was very cold, one of the record-setting cold days. It was negative 13 degrees Fahrenheit was the high for the day, and the church furnace was broken. <laughs> but the first version of that crystal salad bowl when it went from the frigid cold of my uncle's trunk into the warmth of the reception hall, shattered. Wow. And so for me, I have always known that that bowl was very valuable, very fragile, and therefore it sat unused. It was too precious to risk breaking it again. Now, I know that my aunt and uncle have always envisioned me using this bowl. They've probably thought that it has been used for Caesar salad or uh, bean salad or even fruit salad. Maybe even something delicious like Boyer's sliced peaches. <laughs> <laughs> they probably consider this bowl so valuable that I would be determined to risk using it. On this, our second week of our sermon series, If You Want to Walk on Water, You Have to Get Out of the Boat, we are talking about the gifts that God gives us and how we use them. God's entrusted each of us with gifts. We've been equipped for service, and are expected to contribute. They're not gifts of our choosing, but gifts that God has chosen for us, for his work in the kingdom. And we call these spiritual gifts. A spiritual gift is a special ability that God gives according to God's grace to each member in the body of Christ to be used for the common good. Let me break that down again. We are each given a specific gift. It's a unique gift mix. They're not better or worse than somebody else's gift. There's a great wide diversity of gifts and there's a deep disbursement. Some get a little, some get a lot. Our gifts are different from our neighbors and that way they complement and we can all work together. Two, the gifts are given according to God's grace. We don't earn them. They're not rewards from being right or doing the right things. Now you'll find in Galatians 5, there's a different discussion there about the fruits of the Spirit. Those are given as a result of Christian maturity, but right now we're talking about spiritual gifts. These abilities or gifts are not just given for individual growth, but to benefit the whole community, to build up the body of Christ. Just as our skin and our muscles and our bones and our organs all work together to make a vital body, so too do those who are called to be teachers and those who are called to be leaders, wise truth tellers, generous givers, or mercy workers. We all are blessed with spiritual gifts so that we can be a blessing to others. You can learn more about the variety of spiritual gifts by reading Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, or today's scripture, Ephesians 4. Everybody has at least one gift. Uh, not all of you might be aware of that. Not all of you might know or discern what your gift is. And so I've been running around to the small groups and encouraging people to take a spiritual gift inventory. There's one available online and there's one available in paper. And in the narthex, in the entryway, 
there are paper copies and online copies. And I'm hoping that many people will give this a try, either in paper or online, and bring back the results and put them in the offering plate and offer up their spiritual gifts. Finally, God expects us to use our gifts. Jesus commands us to get out of that boat. Just for those of you who haven't been following each week on our sermon series, I'm just going to recap that story. In the wee hours of the dark and stormy night, Jesus strode off across the wavy seas of Galilee. John Otenberg, who wrote the book that inspired this sermon series, says that his intention was to pass by the disciples. Now that word, pass by, it's an English transla translation of a Greek word, parekomai, parekomai. It actually means to show God's self or to reveal God's power and presence, or to send a divine message from God. So Jesus isn't simply just walking out to join the disciples in the boat, and neither was his intention to walk straight by to the other side of the lake. He was walking out intentionally at that day, at that time, on that sea, to Parochema, to show himself to offer the disciples the opportunity to fully know him, to fully trust him, and to take courage through him. Now Peter, Peter recognized what was going on right away. And so he understood this opportunity was so valuable that he risked getting out of the boat. The other disciples were not willing to take that risk. And they missed the chance to fully appreciate Jesus' gift. This congregation is blessed with many Peters. People who recognize the value of God's gift and will put them to good use. Theo and Marion use their gifts to make God's word come alive for us Theo through his music and Marion through her music of the word. And I depend on Amy Gant's gift of administration to keep me on track, and her husband Alan's gift to, for, of communication so that I can send out newsletters and you'll all understand what's going on at the church. Our building, our parsonage, would be in shambles without Amen. Bob and Linda. <laughs> Wendy and Dan are brand new to our congregation, and yet you can see the difference that their sweat has made if you walked downstairs and have a look at our friendship hall. I sent out emails to various members of the congregation, and I got one back from Laura. And I'm going to read one paragraph out of her email because she had a lot to say. I'm going to read one paragraph. <laughs> I remember Jean Fox having unwavering belief in me when I was a teenager and had to be, speak in front of the church one morning about a Bible passage she'd given me a few weeks before. Like any self-respecting teenager, I waited until the night before to read the passage and write my piece only to have my mom proofread it the next morning and tell me I had completely missed the message. Ten minutes before we walked out the door to go to church, I fumbled, I pieced it together between what I took from it and what my mom said it was supposed to mean and shakingly made it through the service. Directly after, <coughs> Miss Jean came running up to me gave me the biggest bear hug and kiss on the cheek and told me I'd done wonderfully, that she loved me and was proud of me. Now, if memory serves, I'm sure that's far from the truth, but the takeaway was that regardless of what I did or how I stumbled, she loved me and was proud of me. 
You don't find unconditional love like that everywhere. But if there's one place you should, it's church. And Miss Jean is an expert. She used her gift of love and encouragement to strengthen and grow a young person into someone who's become an adult that's a vital part of this congregation. It was Melvin's idea that we should gather together not only for rally day or homecoming weekend, but also for a senior lunch so that we could recognize those hardworking, gift-sharing people while they were still present with us. We are here today to celebrate laughter and friendship and the lives of the wonderful saints that have taught us and then gone ahead of us into heaven. And the lives and the, of the wise and experienced men and women who continue to share their gifts with us and make a difference in our congregation, our community, and our world. There are many people working behind the scenes to keep this church strong and to keep this congregation vital. You know, by working together, we have been able to reach beyond the walls of our building, right out into the community, children just in Ridgeway Elementary School down the road. We're given backpacks full of school supplies, and both Delmont and Severin contribute to the food bank, the cat food bank, which happens to be in Severin's basement, but which is many churches working together. I know, because there's already groceries in the back of my car. The United Methodist women put together Thanksgiving baskets, and they organize gifts to give to families whose Christmases would otherwise just be so dis desperate. The prayer shawl ministry at Severn wraps those who are hurting in God's warmth and love. The effects of our gifts reach even farther than our community. All of the local churches in the United Methodist Church are connected and they work together to solve really big problems. When Hurricane Isaac was threatening the coast of Louisiana recently, the local churches sprang into action. Just as we became a cooling center in the heat of July this year, the bigger, safer, stronger churches became emergency shelters during the uh, uh, storm of Isaac. Congregations like the Seashore Mission that work with homeless people they were totally evacuated into the biggest churches. And so 48 men and women took shelter in First United Methodist Church of Biloxi from the Seashore Mission. Our gifts can even reach beyond our nation. The United Methodist Committee on Relief was already in Haiti working on rebuilding after the earthquake when Isaac hit there. But they were already there and already had supplies to bring relief to that country. When we do things like work on the crop walk, that's a local walk here in Glen Burnie, one afternoon after church. But all of us working together, our church, Glen Burnie Church, Severn Church, all our local churches, there's over 2,000 congregations across the United States working on this project. What a difference that's going to make for both the local food banks and world hunger. I shudder to think what would happen if we don't step out when Christ calls. Those of us who are like Peter and we jump right out of that boat, we end up growing. Even if we go through a sinking wet time, we grow. Those who remain safe in the boat are at risk of stagnation. Don't we just love to watch stuff grow? Haven't we not taken zillions of pictures of our children as they grow up? All week I've been seeing Facebook postings of the really little ones going off to their first day of school and the medium-sized ones getting ready for another year much more boldly and the really tall ones going off to college. 
Now my daughter is pregnant. She's in her final semester. And I spent a lot of time with her last week. And oh, her belly is growing. And it's so magnificent. With it, so do our hopes and prayers of a healthy baby. On the other hand, we don't plan for stagnation, do we? We don't wish that our children will sit numbly in front of the television or remain zoned out with a game controller in their hand. Couples don't hope that their marriage will plateau, the intimacy fade until the time it's like there's two polite people just kind of living together. Stagnation, unrealized potential, boredom. Greg Levoy claims these lead to the common cold of the soul. He says, they lead to sinful patterns of behavior that never get confronted or changed. Abilities and gifts that never get cultivated or deployed until weeks become months and months become years and one day you're looking back on a life of deep, intimate, gut-wrenchingly honest conversations that never happened. Great Bold prayers never prayed. Exhilarating risks never taken. Special sacrificial gifts never offered. Lives never touched. And you're sitting in a recliner with a shriveled soul and forgotten dreams. And you realize there is a whole world in desperate need and a great God calling you to be part of something bigger than yourself, you see the person that you could have become and did not. You never followed your calling. You never got out of the boat. It's so sad. The tragedy of the unopened gift. But we don't have to follow that path. We don't have to play the blame game. I would develop my gifts, but I work under a stifling boss. I would pursue a different job, but I need the security of this one. I would devote energy to a more spiritual growth, but I can't find the time. And we don't have to play the when-then game either. When I feel more confident, then I will use my gift. When my spouse is more receptive, then I will become a better partner. We can't wait our whole lives for a when that might not come. Henry Theo Thoreau wrote, I did not wish to live what was not life. I wanted to live deep and suck the marrow of life. Our lives and what we do with them matters. It's of supreme importance. What gifts have you been given? What's your deepest passion? Where will you take a new step or a first step? What has the Lord given you that you need to risk? The Lord of the gift can take five, lo five fish and two loaves and feed the multitudes. The Lord of the gift can go from a blood-stained cross to an empty tomb. The Lord of the gift can take 12 bumbling followers and make a community that has spread over the whole world with a dream that just won't be extinguished. The Lord of the gift can take what you have to offer and make a difference that matters for eternity. Will you take this moment to say, God, this is yours, and offer up your spiritual forgiveness. Will you risk it? Will you get out of the boat and walk with Jesus? Amen.